bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, just to honor you on this Wednesday night, Lord God. Father, we ask that you would just be with us as we go forward in our Bible study teaching on tonight. Father, I pray that you would just begin to minister to our hearts, Lord God, as it pertains to the subject matter at hand. Father, there are so many individuals that are dealing with rejection, some stemming back to their childhood years. And Father, we know that it is your desire for us, your children, to be free and not in bondage. It is your desire that we have good relationships with one another instead of secluding ourselves, Lord God. But sometimes as a result of what we've been through, Lord God, we automatically do certain things. But Father, I'm believing that at the end of this teaching, Lord God, when this series is completed, Lord God, that anybody that may be sitting underneath the sound of my voice or anybody that may be tuning into these messages via live stream, that they will get delivered, Lord God. That they will know how to handle the different challenges that they face from day to day. Because one thing we know for sure, Lord, is that rejection is something that we cannot avoid. And so, Father, I ask that you just touch me right now as I simply prepare myself to deliver your teaching on tonight. Father, I ask that you just give anybody safe traveling mercies that may be on their way. In the midst of everything, Lord God, we want you alone to be glorified. Yeah. We love you, Lord God. We honor you, Lord God. We just praise your holy and matchless name on tonight, Lord God, because you are worthy. Yeah. Father, if you, did any, if you didn't do anything else, Lord God, we still have enough things to continue to pray, praise you for for the rest yeah. of our life, Lord yeah. God. Yeah. Father, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Welcome anybody that's tuning in to our Bible study on tonight via the live stream. As usual, it is a pleasure to be able to have you to come and worship with us in this way. And so we're going to continue tonight on our teaching on rejection. Amen. And one of the things that we talked about when we last uh, ended our teaching last week is that it is so important that we learn to release things from our past. Amen. We need to get to a place where we forgive and we forget. And when I say forget, I'm not talking about uh, you not having any recollection of the things that have actually taken place to you because that's impossible. Your mind is like a computer. But when it comes down to it, you have to be willing to forgive. You have to be willing to excuse a part of another in spite of their slights, amen? In spite of their impolite acts and in spite of their humiliating discourtesy. You must be willing to excuse a part of another in spite of their shortcomings, meaning defects, amen? Sometimes we have defects simply by the way we were brought up, amen? Uh, we see a lot of things that continue as patterns in family history, and so sometimes we have defects, and it can cause us to reject you when we don't know we're rejecting you, and so if something like that takes place, we need to be able to excuse or pardon somebody for their shortcomings or for their errors, amen? We need to get to a place where we cease to feel resentment against an offender. You want to know if you really have forgiven somebody? When you think about them, it doesn't cringe you. When you think about them, it doesn't get you upset all over again. You, your, your blood doesn't stop boiling on the inside. And so to forgive is to cease to, for, to, cease to feel resentment against an offender. And then again, we said to forget means to disregard intentionally. You have the purpose in your heart and in your mind that I'm going to let it go. And so it's important. If you're going to get free from rejection, if you're going to get delivered, one of the things you have to do is forgive and forget. And so we have to be determined in our hearts that we're going to be the victor and not the victim. And so turn your Bibles, if you can, to Galatians chapter 1. And we're going to just look at verse 10. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. I'm reading from the New King James Version, unless otherwise noted for those of you all that may be tuning in. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, and I would like for one of you all to read that scripture for me on tonight, amen? Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, you're going to read that for us uh, in my tea doctor? All right, okay, let's go. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? 
For if I still please men, I would not be a bond servant, servant of Christ. Paul is posing some questions in this particular passage of scripture that called you to really think. Are you really trying to please people? Or are you trying to please God? Because how many of you know if you constantly live your life trying to please people, people will never be satisfied. Some will like you and some won't. You can never do anything where one person or multiple people are just totally satisfied with everything that you do. It's just not going to happen. And so when you understand that people are fickle, Amen. I had a conversation with somebody the other day. I said, let me tell you something. One thing we got to understand, people will love you one minute and they will hate you the next. I said, especially when you stay in a leadership position, especially as a pastor. You'll know people, oh, pastor, you are the greatest. I am so, you know, thankful for you. I love you and how God is using you in my life and different things that nature. We know all glory goes to God. But those same individuals can turn around and stab you in the back, can't stand you, talk about you like a dog. So when it comes down to dealing with people, you got to understand that people are fickle. God isn't. So your number one focus should be about pleasing God. But when you deal with rejection, you often struggle with being a people pleaser. And so I wanted to share something with you all that I saw on Facebook. Amen. You all know me in my Facebook posts. Hallelujah. But... Uh, I saw something on Facebook, and it really stood out to me, and I said I wanted to share it because it was a sponsored post. And a sponsored post on Facebook is a post that somebody has paid uh, to have generate in the individual's timeline. They don't have to be your friend. It's going to generate on everybody's timeline because they pay. And so it says sponsor. So this person isn't a friend of mine or anything, but two days after we left here, we had our Bible study on Wednesday. Dealing with rejection, our first night of the teaching. Two days after that, on Friday, this post circulated in my timeline. So I want to share it with you all. It says, growing up with rejection or abandonment. Anyone who has been subjected to either rejection or abandonment becomes a person who seeks major approval. It is a natural response as well as it is a natural response as we all desire to be accepted and loved unconditionally. Amen? When we don't yet understand or accept who we are in Christ, the need for approval becomes like a drug. And the person we seek it from becomes the dealer. They hold a certain amount of power over us. And we can even unknowingly worship them. What many refer to as an approval addiction is actually a major form of slavery. It keeps us bound to an identity that is always defined by what a person or a self-worth that is communicated through our situation. I truly understand this because before I accepted Christ, I sought approval from men. And then, once in the church, I sought it from other sources, such as spiritual leaders. When we are in the world, it is easier to identify this unhealthy behavior. But it has a way of masking itself in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, this need for approval comes out in many ways such as someone who is easily offended, someone who desires the spotlight, someone who needs constant pats on the back for what they do, someone who gets jealous, or someone who is willing to serve all the time at any cost, even to the point of neglecting self or family, God opened my eyes to this need for approval over the last number of years as he has allowed my ministry to begin to flourish. Being in ministry with a wounded identity is very dangerous. The need for approval will ultimately cause one to compromise. God had to reveal this to me for several reasons. Here are just two of them. First, I will have to learn to listen and obey his voice and not be overly concerned about the criticism or disapproval of others who did not understand what he was doing in my life. 
And second, because of what I do, various people will try to attach to me for the wrong reason. And if my goal is to be liked, I could find myself in compromise. God had to break this need to be liked and accepted off of me. Although God has done a mighty work in me over the years, he is still working on me. And so this morning through the following scripture, he gave me even deeper revelation that sparked this post. Romans 8.15 says, so you should not be like cowering, fearful slaves. You should behave instead like God's very own children adopted into his family, calling him father, dear father. The constant need for man's approval makes one a slave. And for that reason, a person will always be fearful, fearful of being rejected. I am sure that it grieves the heart of God when it matters more what other people think than what he says about us. God wants us to come to the place where only his approval matters and his unconditional love is all we truly need. Yes. We will have others who love us, but we should not desire their love above the love of our Heavenly Father. Whatever your biological parents did not give you, God still has it for you. And it's okay to have spiritual parents, but your true self-worth, value, purpose, and identity can only be received through a personal and an intimate relationship with God, our Father. And so if you struggle with the need for approval, I pray that through the revelation in this post, you will be healed, delivered, and set free from the slavery of man's approval. When it comes down to it, that was written by a young lady named Ann Thomas, who is an author and a speaker. And I said it was just key. God truly has a way of sometimes confirming uh, what it is that you're actually teaching or what's necessary. Because as I said before, there are many individuals that deal with and suffer with the root of the spirit of rejection. And so, as I said in the beginning uh, of this teaching, rejection is something that we cannot avoid. Why not? Can somebody please tell me why we cannot avoid rejection? Microphone, anybody. Tell me why we cannot avoid rejection. Because we in this world with other people. Okay, we in this world with other people, amen. Anybody want to add anything else as to why we can't avoid rejection? Because people are just going to, it's just something that somebody's going to do. Like you say, it just might be because they don't like us. Uh, even times they might not even like themselves. Amen, amen. And so the bottom line is, we can't avoid it. It's a part of life. You got something? Come on. Because uh, you're going to be told no. Because you're going to be told no. I started out saying no is a word. Sometimes you're not going to get your way. And sometimes when people don't give us what we want or do what we want or accept us because we want to be accepted, then we deal with rejection. And so it's something that we cannot avoid. And please understand that when it comes down to it, everybody that rejects you isn't out to hurt you. That's what you have to understand. You can't take it so personal. You can't feel like an individual has it out for you and they are on a mission to hurt you. No. Some people reject you and they may have a bad motive behind it, but that's not everybody. For example, because as I say, everybody that rejects you isn't out to personally hurt you, make you feel bad, make you cry, and things of that nature. An example, real talk. We know that when we're single, right? When we're single, we date. We meet people. Guess what? A person may not necessarily be interested in dating you, and that is a real fact. And they may make it known that they're not interested in taking the relationship further. That is a form of rejection. But guess what? Isn't everybody entitled to what they like and don't like? 
Let me ask you, have you ever had somebody to come on to you and you were not interested in them and you turned them down? Hello? Anybody in here? Okay, so guess what? You rejected somebody too. Because you have a right to make a decision as to whether you want to accept the person in your life in a certain way or not. But when you rejected them yourself, you knew, first of all, they ain't my type. We're on two different pages. For real, I'm not physically attracted to them, whatever the case may be. When you said, oh, no, thank you, and you refused to give your number, whatever the case may be, you weren't on the mission to hurt them, were you? You just made a decision. And so we have to understand that every time we're rejected, no matter what the situation is, it doesn't mean that somebody is out to hurt us. Pass the microphone. So with that being said, all no's are not a form of rejection. No, not, not all no's are a form of, I mean, I mean, you can say, Mom, can I go outside and play? And your mother can say no. That's not a form. That, ain't, that ain't rejection unless you just take your person, whether she don't want me to go outside because she don't love me. And, you know, it depends on where you go with it. Because if you got your own issues, you can take that no and run with it. Amen? All right. And so unfortunately, when you struggle with rejection, you tend to take everything as a personal hit against you. That's why you have to be delivered. Because rejection is going to happen. You got to be able to handle it the right way. And if you don't, you're going to take everything personal. And so Jesus Christ was rejected in Nazareth. Amen. The place where he spent his boyhood years, his hometown, amen? Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, this is a very familiar passage of scripture, but Mark chapter 6, and we're just going to look at verse 4. Mark chapter 6, verse 4. And as I said, Jesus Christ himself was rejected. So guess what? If he was rejected, who are we? He already told us that, guess what? They hate me, and so they're going to hate you. And know that they hate you is because they hated me first. And as I said before, sometimes you are not liked and rejected simply because of your association. Mm -hmm. Those that you may associate with. And so Mark chapter 6, verse 4, is what I want us to look at, just one passage. And it says, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country among his own relatives, and in his own house. You think about it. He's there with his family and friends, and he's coming to really share the word with them and help to change their life, and they reject him, his people, those that he loved, those that he cared about. And so when you think about it, we touched on this last week. Angelina brought the point up. When Mr. Folks was talking about somebody that, you know, she had a little run-in with, and it was brought to her attention, don't sweat any and everybody that rejects you or don't treat you the way you think you should be treated. When it comes down to it, to be rejected by people that don't mean a lot to you may hurt a little bit. It may bother you. But it's, going, it's not going to get you to the point where you're just crying, you're sulking, you're depressed, and different things of that nature. But can you imagine, like Jesus, what it's like when that rejection comes from people you know and love, especially your family? It's devastating. And oftentimes, if you go back and you talk to a lot of adults that do suffer and deal with rejection, it started in the home. Oftentimes, something took place in the home by those closest to them that devastated them. And your mind will tell you, if my mother and father, who's supposed to love me, rejected me, well, what am I to anybody else? And a lot of people walk around carrying that pain and carrying that hurt. Can you get delivered from it? Yes. But it's real. So when you start talking to individuals, you find out, oh, there were some things that took place 
way back early on in life with a lot of individuals that struggle with rejection. And so rejection is one of Satan's favorite tools to use against people, and he doesn't wait long to begin to plant the seeds of rejection. Sometimes the seeds of rejection are planted in the womb. When a child is being carried in its mother's womb. Because we don't understand all the miraculous things about birth. As far as the child being on the inside of us, what the child can comprehend and what the child can't comprehend. But the child, as it begins to develop, can hear, can sense. And so sometimes you may have mothers that talk to their babies while they're in their belly and rub their bellies and, you know, sing songs and different things of that nature. You know, and the baby is connecting with the mother while in the womb. But you got some individuals that are pregnant and mad about being pregnant. Going through with the father, mad about being pregnant, really don't want no kids, but just don't get an abortion. So for real, there's no real bonding that actually takes place. And so rejection can take place starting in the womb. And so it's one of those tools that he likes to use. And so let's define what it means to reject someone. Let's look at the word reject. First of all, it means to refuse to accept, consider, or use. The word reject means to refuse as a lover, a spouse, or a friend. When I think about it in the terms of being rejected as a lover or a spouse, guess what? A lot of people today are messed up because of this type of rejection. And as a result, what do they normally do? A lot of people do. Talk to me, somebody. Think about it. I'm talking about the rejection. When somebody rejects you as a lover or a spouse, and it happens to you over and over and over again. Come on. They go from relationship to relationship to relationship. They go from relationship to relationship. That's right. And something else. Something else they do. Come on. Talk to the mic so we can hear you. They begin to do it to others. They begin to do it to others? Uh-huh. Come on. Can, can y'all think of something that's real prevalent? Just come on. Give it to Deacon James. They uh, go to the uh, same sex. Go to the same sex. Come on now. There are so many individuals, and you'll hear it a lot sometimes with women. They have been through so much bad stuff with guys and relationships that they feel like, I can't deal with that no more. A woman will understand me better, and that's their reason for being in a relationship with a woman. Because they have been rejected so much by so many different men. Think about it. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What's cute to me may not be cute to you. There may be some individuals in the world that a lot of people may not find attractive. So sometimes even growing up as a child and you're the boy in the school that no girl likes, you begin to be insecure about yourself. Next thing you know, you come in contact with a spirit that can discern that, attach itself to you, reach out to you, and because you have a strong need for approval, Next thing you know, you find yourself with somebody, again, of the same sex. It's real. It happens a lot. Amen? All right. And so, when, as I said, a lot of people deal with rejection um, and turn to the same sex because of rejection. Another uh, definition for the word reject means to be unkind. When you think about a reject, a reject is a rejected person or thing that is not wanted, unsatisfactory, or not fulfilling standard requirements. And so question, based on the different definitions that I've just given as to what it means uh, to reject someone, have you ever been rejected before in life? Has anybody ever been rejected? Have you rejected others? 
So it's a common thing. And so again, through this teaching, I pray that you will learn how to identify the root of rejection, get set free from rejection, and refuse to be in bondage to it, as well as learn how to identify signs of rejection in others. Why would it be good for you to be able to identify signs of rejection in others? Why would that be a good thing? To be able to identify it in others. Anybody? I guess to try to help them out, try to um, bring them out of it, or to give them some type of guidance or something. Amen. To be able to help them out and to guide them, because you can identify for real this is what's really going on with you. And then sometimes it's good to be able to identify rejection in others so that you don't ter take their actions personal. When they, when they treat you a certain way or whatever, it's at the point where you can, you can identify where this is really coming from and you can guard your heart. Because sometimes they're being mean to you because of what they're struggling with. And when you realize that the root of their actions is a result of rejection, then you guard your heart and you refuse to take it personal. It is very important. And so rejection causes people to become insecure. The word insecure means lacking confidence, unsure, shaky, or unsound. Oftentimes, insecure people try to appear to be secure, meaning confident and, 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 and in control. Amen? You know, as we said last week, sometimes you have individuals that seem to be hard and, you know, seem to have a mindset or a demeanor about them that nothing really phases them, that's not true. Because oftentimes you will find out that that is a cover-up. That is their way of protecting themselves. And so many insecure people try to appear secure based on their stuff, their money. See, because sometimes if I ain't feeling real good about myself, when I got lots of money, guess what? Money gives a lot of people a false sense of power. So, you know, just like the prodigal son, when he went out there and did his thing, he had all his friends, everybody, but when all the money was gone, he ain't had nobody. See, the thing is, sometimes people will attract to you because of money. I think about a lot of the stars. They don't know who's really their friend or not because a lot of people are drawn to them because of their money. And so if you are a person that struggles with rejection or you are insecure, money can make you feel like you're all that. Sometimes the job, you have the title as the CEO of the company. You know, it puffs you up. You know, when it comes down to it, the way they look. You know, oftentimes so much is put on into the exterior uh, uh, appearance, appearance because of their struggles, amen, uh, of their own insecurities. Sometimes the cars they drive or the labels in their clothes, everything may be designer, you know, and, and they want everybody to know it. Oftentimes, it's because of their own insecurity, the houses that they live in. So when you struggle with insecurities, these type of things can make you feel like I'm on top of the world. But for real, you can have all of that stuff. But if you don't get delivered, you still ain't going to have joy. You still ain't going to have joy. You have a temporary fix, but it's not going to be permanent. And so you got to become secure in who you are. As I started out last week, the scripture, I said, you got to know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so all of that is vanity when you think about it. Cars, jobs, money, uh, all the exterior stuff, the, the clothes, the houses, all of that is vanity when you lack the peace of God. Our security has to come from knowing who we are in Christ Jesus. And so we're going to talk about some of the causes of rejection. Key word, some, not all. Because there are so many other things that as we go through this teaching, you may be able to identify, oh, in yourself, oh, this is also a cause of rejection when I look at what's taking place in my life. So some of the causes of rejection, unwanted conception, conception as I already said. Sometimes when you don't necessarily want a child, but you have a child, it can cause some major problems. And so, as I said, it can start in the womb. But guess what? When that child is born, 
you as a parent can be disconnected from that child because you never really wanted it. Oh, you feed the child, you clothe the child, you put a roof over the child's head, but because there's a disconnect, you don't really connect with the child. And that causes, that's a cause of rejection for that child. That child ends up growing up with a lot of different issues. Another cause of rejection is even contemplating or attempting abortion. You know, again, you know, sometimes you hear individual stories. I think it was Fred Hammond's mother that tried to abort him or, you know, take his life early in, early in life, but it, it wasn't successful, the procedure. Sometimes, even if a person can give a testimony about what they were going to do, if the person that hears it ain't strong enough, it could affect them in a negative way. I mean, because I've shared my story. You know, my youngest daughter, I was going to give her up for adoption. Both of my pregnancies were unwanted. It's not like I were, was an individual that was planning to have children and have a family. And so I know that I share my testimony often. But the bottom line is sometimes a person may can hear that and start internalizing it the wrong kind of way. And so, you know, it can cause an individual to have rejection. Another cause of rejection is a child born as the wrong sex. My mother wanted a boy, but I was pregnant with Jamie. She wanted a boy so bad. Because we have a family full of women. Before the child was even born, the room and everything was painted blue. When Jamil was born, she was upset. She was like, oh my gosh, it's a girl, <laughs> you know? But she didn't treat her bad then, so she ended up being a girl. But sometimes, just think about it. If a father wanted a son, but you know how daddies can be. They want that gender. They want that boy. And they really want that boy. And it's a girl. Disappointed. Now they got the girl out there playing football, basketball, you know, running track. I mean, doing all this other stuff. And for real, it's like, excuse me, she's a girl. But for real, they really wanted a son. And so sometimes that can cause rejection. A child born as the wrong sex, so to say. Another cause of rejection is a child born with defects. A child born with defects. Learning disabilities. Physical disabilities. Because guess what? They know they're different. The mama and the daddy half the time didn't have anything to do with the physical defects. Two parents that are healthy can have a child that has Down syndrome. Or a child can be born without their arms. I mean, you see this one guy, he rolls around on his little roller skate. He don't have no arms or legs. He's just a body. I can only imagine what life was like for him growing up. But sometimes if that child is you, it causes you to struggle with rejection. Because sometimes people may look at you a little funny. They never get the opportunity to get close to you because they can't get past how you look. And they keep themselves away. And that hurts. So we need to be mindful. I was so honored and excited at the top teens uh, 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 event that they had because they have a little guy in there. He's about a little teeny guy. He's a teenager, you know, high school, you know, physical. No, the other one, with the, you wasn't there. That's right, you wasn't there. But this one has some physical challenges, you know. And I know he's probably experienced a lot, but his personality is so bubbly. You know, and it's like sometimes we never take the opportunity to get close to people because we let what we see stop us. Physical disabilities. I thought about this. This is on a personal note. I had to minister to my own mother this week because my stepsister Novella got upset and she said some things to my mother and it's like, where is that coming from? My mother was busy, she was working, Novella needed to get to the grocery store. Of course she didn't call me, she didn't call Jamil or anybody, ain't nobody know. She was calling my mother, my mother was working. Her response was, all you care about is your family. That's what she said. All you care about is your family. And it's like, really? Anybody that knows, we've had her since she was a little girl. 
none of her natural family is in her life at all. We're the only family that she has. My mother was upset. And then I called her back and I said, Mom, that was rejection that was speaking. Yes, yeah, she has her physical challenges, but that don't mean she can't understand and relate to some stuff. She know her own father ain't around. She know her aunts and brothers that she do have out there, they're nowhere around. And that bothers her. And sometimes when you deal with rejection, you don't know how to explain your hurt, so it comes off as anger. And so when I shared that with my mother, she handled the situation a little different. And they talked. And her thing is, she looks at us like, we're the family. Jamia, Jasmine, me, Khalil. Why? Because we're all blood related. Come on. And. Get the um, microphone there. And because she might have a different father. So, you know, when you have parents that say you're the oldest child mm -hmm. and your mother or and your parents weren't married and then they get with somebody else, you feel like the outside child. Yes. So it's not that Novella was being mean. Like you say, it came from rejection. It came from rejection. And that's what people don't understand the mind of how a child perceives things. Because it's like, okay, you got one mother, two different fathers. That oftentimes can play problems in the life of a child if one of the fathers is around. Because I know with my daughter, Jamia, her father was not around. And then when I got pregnant with Jasmine, me and Jasmine's father got into a relationship together. And so in the midst of that, yeah, we were all there together, but she see that Jasmine's dad is here, but my dad's not here. That hurts a child. Jasmine's dad would do certain things, and I'll never forget, Jamia said one day, I want a daddy that comes and pick me up from school, because she looked at all the other kids whose fathers picked them up from school. And she wanted that. And so they don't understand a lot of times. They see, they feel like it's us against them. That's why I can't, one of the chapters in my book for So You Think You Want to Get Married is entitled The Brady Bunch, The Blended Family. Come on. And it's not like motherfuckers treated her different. Not at all. It's just in her mind, you know, I feel like the outsider because it's, you, daddy, and whoever. Mm -hmm. and, okay, in that case, it was just, you know, mother folks, you, and her. And mm -hmm. then come Jimmy and Jasmine. So it's nothing that mother folks did. It's just what's going on within her. Perception. And it's real. Pass it over. Okay, so, Eva. She didn't use any rejection against her, did she? No. When she responded like that, mm -hmm. no. I, I was able to calm her down to make sure that she didn't respond because in her mind, all that I do, I've never treated you any different. You know, I do everything for you. You've always been here. We are your family. And you want to make a bold statement like all you care about is your family as if saying I'm not your family. So she, calm, I got her to calm down. Mm -hmm. But see, sometimes I think the question is, when a person attack you and reject you, you gonna attack them back. A lot of times and, you will. And, and basically, in your heart, you don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But you have been rejected. Mm -hmm. oh, no, no, you're not getting the best of me. Mm -hmm. And you react, react back to that person. Because mm -hmm. hurt people hurt people. And so as a child, we would perceive rejection in so many different ways. When me and, and Deacon James were dating, oh, we were fine. My kids didn't have a problem. We dated for four years before we got married. They didn't have a problem. They was happy. They was all right. As soon 
as it was time for the wedding day. The one that's super taxed to me, Jasmine, started tripping. She was the devil at our wedding. <laughs> and I'm telling you, and, and I'm, I'm being laughing, but I'm being serious because after we got married, we had to deal with her together and confront the spirits that was ministering to her mind. Because in her mind, projection is about to take place because now you can't love me because you got him. And it was real. It was a real pain for her. But I had to explain to her, baby, mommy has enough love for you, for him, for Jamea, and so many other people. But your perception can take you in some places that cause you to hurt deeply when you don't need to. Come on. You need to have the discernment that it is a spirit of rejection so you don't react in the natural and come off like, uh -huh. you know, so yeah, you gotta, you gotta see the spirit and you gotta, you gotta see it for what it is. It's, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And, 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 and oftentimes, you know, going back, cause like I said, a lot of this rejection goes back to when we're children. A lot of times, Parents don't really consider the fact that children have real genuine feelings and what they go through. Even to the point when we were dating, yes, and even since we've been married, we have children that didn't necessarily live in the home with us. There will be so many times I will share with my husband, go spend some time one-on-one. -on -one. Because yeah, we do things together. But she needs your one-on-one -on -one time. Because no matter what, it's still in the mind, y'all and me. Come on, you have something? Yeah. Um, when you speak about children being rejected at a young age, and it's not just a, from a blended family. It could be just within the family. Because mm -hmm. um, I remember one time, my brother was supposed to tell my brother, my my father something that my mother had told him to say. And um, it was just something he wanted to get off his chest, but he didn't know how to say it. So he put me up to it. And I'm the youngest. Mm -hmm. I'm like, sure, I love my brother. I'll tell him. Because that's how we all felt. And when we told my father, he ran to my brother and hugged him and said, how could you feel that way? Mm -hmm. And he never came to me. And you know, that thing still plays in my mind. I want to, I could see it, it's clear as day, like I turned around and I was like, <laughs> and I was the youngest, mm -hmm. and I was like, why? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it does. And like you said, it can happen in, with siblings that have the same mother and the same father. Because sometimes parents cause children to feel rejection because of favoritism. Kids can sense that, and that hurts. It's like you accept them, you receive them, but you don't really accept me and receive me. That hurts. That does a lot. We see it in the Bible. Joseph was his father's favorite child. His brothers hated him. They wanted to kill him. Instead of killing him, they put him in a ditch and then sold him off to slavery. But they couldn't stand their own flesh and blood because of daddy's favoritism. And so parents, again, can play a major role in why children often grow up to be adults that struggle with rejection. Because if I couldn't get the attention from my mom and my daddy in my home, then guess what? At a certain age, you won't go give it to wrong people, looking for people that's going to accept you and approve you. Come on. Sometimes, though, we have to be mindful that it can just be, we can just have it in our mind that we're being rejected. And it's not. That may not be the case. Yes. Just, you know, just that's just our perception, and that's not it's not really taking place. So we gotta be mindful of that too. I mean, I've I've done that. Now I'm not just talking about the children, but just even as adults, you can just perceive that you're being rejected, but it's not the case. And 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 that is the key because perception is everything. And what happens oftentimes is when there is a strong root of rejection in a person's life, their perception becomes off with everybody. 
Sometimes in their mind, everybody rejected them when that's not the case. So that's why it's key. We got to make sure we ain't tripping. Is this really happening or is this me? Does this person remind me of somebody else that rejected me because they wear the same cologne or is this me? Your mind can go there. And so you have to be mindful because sometimes you put everybody in one category. Come on. I think the uh, reason why me and my mother have a distance with each other is because as a child, when my mother and father were getting divorced, my father was you know, manipulating me, trying to say, okay, we're, you can go here, you can do this. If you come stay with me, I'm going to give you this and give you that. So I told my mother I want to stay with my father. Mm -hmm. So I think she felt rejected when I told her that. And I feel like ever since then, there have been a distance between us. Mm -hmm. I mean, because the average mama can't imagine, even though a child has a mommy and a daddy, we know most cases, if there's a breakup, the child usually ends up with who? The mother. The mother. And for real, sometimes the mother feel like they got that right when they really don't. The daddy has just as much of a right. Now, it wasn't right for him to manipulate and, and, like, it wasn't right for them to do that. But I know your mama's feelings was hurt. Because I was faced with a situation with Jamia at the age of five. My lifestyle and me choosing to do the wrong thing caused me to leave her. So for five years of her life, I was in and out, in and out. So it got to a point my mother was just raising her. But then at the age of five, when I got my life together, I was faced with a situation I was afraid that I was going to be rejected, but she didn't reject me, thank God. But my thing to her was, we was leaving, we were separating. At one point, we all lived in the same house. Do you want to come live with mommy, or do you want to stay here with grandma? She said, I want to come live with you. Thank God for unconditional love. Because oftentimes, children will have unconditional love for you as a parent, no matter how messed up you may be sometimes. And so her answer was, I want to come and live with you. But I was prepared. My heart was prepared. But that would have hurt me, even though I would have understood. But, you can pass the microphone to Diggy J. But a child has the right to go with either the mother or the father. But divorce is another cause of rejection. Come on. You said she was about five. I, I think kids really, children really know uh, what they're faced with. I mean, they, they, they really know more than what we think they know. And I, when I think even about what Jameer's situation with you, you're all she had. I'm talking about mother and father. At, at that point, I mean, her dad wasn't there, so... I think she really wanted to be, you know, grandma is great, you know, don't get me wrong, but parents, I mean, children, children want their mother and their father, and I mean, their real mother and father, no matter how good a step-parent or step-father is, because I even think about my situation with my oldest daughter, we all live in, in the house, but in her mind, her perception is, I have my family. And even though she's my blood daughter, she feels like the outsider. So, we, you know, we went through that episode with her, but children, they're very sensitive when it, when it comes to that. And a lot, a lot of the blended family, the way the families are today, rejection is, all, is on a high when it yes. comes to relationships and families yes. and stuff like that. And it's, yes. a lot of it is just... Uh, an effect of how families are, you know, us being really out of our disobedience. Let's just keep it real. Effects of sin. Out of the order that God really yes. wanted. Yes. You know, but we have to really make the best of what we have. It's just, it's just hard, more work for us. Yes. More work that God really didn't intend for us, but because of our disobedience, you reap what you sow. So therefore, it becomes more complex, more, more you know, just complicated, more, you know, just difficult. But with the grace of God, we just make it happen and keep moving forward. Amen. Pass it on down. And that's key. Sin, most of what we're going through with children, 
that are struggling and dealing with rejection because their father ain't there, because mama had a one night stand. The child don't understand that. The child only know I'm supposed to have a mama and a dad. They don't know the issues that really took place. When I think about going from marriage to marriage and you know, now you got four different children and all of them got different, you know, baby daddies or different baby mamas. It was never intended like that. It should have been one woman, one man. And then they got married, you know, married, had their children and a family. All that we're going through, a lot of the stuff that people have to get delivered from is a direct, direct result of sin. Come on. I... I don't like nobody telling me no because I feel like I don't deserve a no. <laughs> well, that's how you feel. You got a right to how you feel, but somebody gonna tell you no. Exactly. But before I, a person can tell me no, I think about it, how to, uh, you know, make them think they want to do for me what I want them to do for me. Manipulation. Yes. Okay. Manipulation, that's the Now, is. <laughs> like cutting the grass, you know, Lisa said to me, look, the guy next door, you know, he does a beautiful job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he do things for me, you know. So she said, ask Tony. No. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I said to myself, I know if I ask Tony, he would do it. Mm -hmm. But, I'm not going to ask. But see, all you have to do is be patient and wait. Because mm -hmm. God's going to send it to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I ain't even going to ask you why you said no, though. <laughs> because talking to her yesterday morning, mm -hmm. Tony, I mean, uh, her, his mother, see, I didn't have to be hurt and for him to tell me no. She said it, but not that she said, oh, Tony will not cut your grass or nothing like that. But listen to what a person is saying. Mm -hmm. You know, she went on saying, yeah, you know, Tony having a hard time. He just barely get over here and cut my grass. Mm -hmm. Now, so that's why I say, I don't put myself in the position to be told no. Right. Because <laughs> I should not be told no if you think about it before just sleep. <laughs> Come, the answer will come. Now, if I went up there and asked him, he said no. I've been home right now thinking of some kind of way to get back at it. And, and, and see, that ain't right. That's wrong. That's wrong. But see, we got to be able to accept no. It was a discerning situation that you heard from, through his mother that this ain't the right time to ask him, even though he knows we help you out, but you can hear but, but this ain't the right time. She didn't even have any idea, or I wasn't going to ask mm -hmm. anyway, but I'm just saying. Be patient and wait. Mm -hmm. you, I put myself in the position, if I listened to Lisa, he'd have said, oh, Mrs. Pender, I would love to do it, but I don't uh -huh. want to hear that. <laughs> you don't want to hear that. It comes sometime, amen. Um, another cause of rejection, and I already touched on that, and that is comparing one sibling to another. We have to be mindful because our children are different. They're not the same. And for real, you don't really want to compare your child to anybody else. You know, I, as I got older, and me and my cousins, we got to talking, Kim and the men, we got to talking. They had some issues with me that I was unaware of. I was unaware of them because my Aunt Susie always compared them to me. You should get good grades like Tanya and, you know, different things of that nature. So I'm always over there because my mother was in the streets. And there was a little bit of hateration for real. But it was because of the comparison. My thing is, kids learn different. They're not on the same levels. Don't do that. Don't say, well, you should have been a straight A student like this person. And why couldn't you do that? That is a terrible thing to do because that will cause the other person to feel rejected. And I think about that even now with my cousin because Lamia, she just constantly would go to school. It was almost as if she had to prove something. I'm like, this girl been in college about 40 years. I'm just using that as an example. Just, just trying to get an AA, you know. But it was almost like trying to prove something because of all the negative stuff that was said. Because sometimes people tell us, you ain't never going to be nothing. 
you can't do this and all this other stuff. And so you live your whole life trying to prove somebody else wrong because they rejected you. They made you feel rejected, less than, not acceptable. And so we got to be mindful of that. Come on. So there's a whole bunch of adults walking around here yes. with some issues of rejection. Yes. It's a whole bunch of a whole adults. I'm, I'm not talking about children. So the cycle needs to be broken. Because can you pass it down as like a generational curse? I mean, it can be something that can be generational in, in the family. I mean, because I think about our own family, starting with their parents. There wasn't a lot of affection and love that was actually manifested. So we have aunts and uncles that didn't necessarily show a lot of love because of what they didn't get. So it's not a thing where, you know, my mother tells me that she loved me all the time. And I tell her that I love her all the time. That's because she started out telling me, I love you all the time. But she said she can't recall one time her mother said that to her or her father to her as a child. I can't, I can't imagine that as a child because it's normal to me. But I can imagine for a child that wants to hear the words, baby, I love you, and they never hear it. I can imagine how that makes them feel like I'm not worthy, another form of feeling rejected. Even to the point they embrace them with the hugs and, you know, you want that. I don't care how grown you are, you still want that. I'm grown, I still want hugs from my mother. And I still hug, I, I hug on my kids and some. But if nobody ever hugs you, if that's not something that you experience, and they didn't experience, and they don't know how to do it, because they didn't feel strange. Like I used to always say, Rose, that ain't know how to show love. She would cuss you out and let you come in and eat all her food. That was her way of showing you love, but she really didn't know how to really embrace you. And so even to hug her was the strangest thing ever, because it wasn't normal for them. So then you got children that sometimes will see other parents hug and love upon their kids, and they want to know, why I don't get this? Oh my gosh. Okay, give me a second. Okay, man. Okay, so we. Wait a minute. Don't let them forget. You got home. Come on, nigga, Jay. <laughs> now, I was going to say that, uh, you know, sometimes as the rejected person, you have to be the strong one. And I, and I think about, like, myself, I didn't get that. Come here, give me a hug. I love you. This, that, and the other. So sometimes we can't sit back and wait for stuff to change. Like you said, break the cycle. We have to, even if you are the rejected person, sometimes we have to go out of our, come out of our comfort zone, yes. go out of our way to the very thing that we crave, we have to do it. Yes. So I, I started hugging my mother, telling her I love her, calling her, just, I'm just calling to check on you, this, that, and the other, stuff like that. And now she calling, she, she's calling, she just pops up. <laughs> When I, when I say I love you, she said I love you too. I mean, my mother, my mother, I used to say I love you, and she, she, she might say, okay. You know what I'm saying? You know how the old school, you know, people that didn't, you know, don't really, because she didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And you, sometimes you got to look at the bigger person, look at the bigger picture. Yes. And know your lineage. Yes. yes. You know, your background, and not take it so serious. Because now I look at my mother, not to blame her or to necessarily criticize her like you don't love me. I know she loves me but she don't know how mm -hmm. because she didn't get that affection. So it trickled down and I know I found out, I find myself being the same way and it's, it's sometimes when God puts you in relationships and show you an alternative because I thought it was the norm. Mm -hmm. All that huggy huggy stuff, it, yeah. was, it wasn't, I wasn't feeling that. But when I met my wife <laughs> And really, Jasmine. But Jasmine is a very, very affectionate. And I see how she was. And just everybody was just so happy and hugging and telling you, telling people, you know, telling each other, I love you, mommy. And just, I'm like, man, this is different. I want that too. So that's how I, that's how I just thought the change came about. But it took you coming into adulthood and exactly. into the relationship with Christ yeah. to bring about the revelation. Mm -hmm. 
That's why our personal relationship with God is so key. And a lot of us don't sometimes don't get it really until we adults. So we dealt with all that stuff for years. So now we're adults and we just have to be made over. Because there's a lot of stuff that we didn't understand that we carried around for so many years. But then as we grow up and we get in Christ, God begins to show us the bigger picture of a thing. Now we do things different. Like you said, you came out of your comfort zone. And it's a wonderful thing. Those of you all that have been here know his cries, how he wanted that relationship. He didn't have it with his mom. Every, every time he turned around, the doorbell rang. It's his mother. Right. One point in time, she would never come over. It's a wonderful thing, just coming on through. Every time he turned around, they on the phone talking. I said, I can see the fruit. His labor was not in vain. He wanted to hug his mother, but she would never hug him. So he started. He wanted to hear the words, I love you. So he started. He wanted to talk more. So he did his part, and guess what? It began to change her. And, and that's what we have to learn. Your mother, my uh -huh. dad and God, see, they still Give it a mic, give it a mic, sir. They still, yeah. No, I'm not. They, they still have that, I don't know what the, I, I don't want to call it a hatred. But your mother, she got to get over that. Mm -hmm. Her mother loved her. My mother never told me she loved me. But as I got older, Mm-hmm. Well, you know, in some situations, I think it's politically correct to say that somebody loves me just because they're my parent, or even as a child, yeah, I guess I love him because he was my father, and I had to come to a realization. How do you really, really love, love somebody that you don't love? No, exactly. You don't have no conversations, but you don't talk to them. I mean, when you see him, it's every blue moon, but ain't no real connection. So I used to say certain things, but I was like, that real love, I can't, it sounds terrible to say it, but I didn't know him. I didn't know him. And so it's growing in relationships that can cause, you can live in a house and still not be connected to somebody. Exactly. And that's the truth. You can be in that house. They could, like again, I said, they could feed you, they could clothe you, they could put a roof over your head, and there's absolutely no relationship. Yes, but yes, I'm gonna share. share my but again, God's love you have. But like I used to tell everybody, I had two, Lisa and Shara. God in heaven knows I love them, but I ain't never liked them. Oh, <laughs> Amen. Go ahead. Okay. So, in the name of Jesus, in exactly. the name of Jesus, the blood for her God. Yes. Okay, come on. So, okay, so that I can understand, okay. not like the first ways. I have my mother is your mother's sister, and they might not get that. And to this day, we can go to the mall. I said, "Come on, mom, let me hold your hand." You know, we just love the dog. We look just alike. Girl, anybody hold your hand? I don't might think we doing it. I'm like, mom. <laughs> what is you? This is not a Jerry Springer moment. Ain't nobody gonna think we together. We nobody's gonna think that. However, she has done much better with the grandchildren. She's an excellent grandma. She didn't make me no cookies. Mm -hmm. She didn't make me no cookies. So now, when I see it. You know, I've seen that um, Serenity was sitting in my mouth like, Grandma, Gigi, Ma, come, 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 come. And I'd be like, really? She was like, Lisi, you need to stop being jealous of these children. But, but, it, even though grown, it's because she didn't do it with me. I mean, yeah, I need to be delivered. Amen. So just pray for me. Here you go, Mary. Amen. And, and the thing is, she's in the process of being delivered, and, it, and it's true. And so sometimes as we get older, we learn how to do things a little different. Exactly. And then there's something supernatural about grandchildren. Yes. That's the only thing I can say. It's something supernatural about grandkids. Because yes. most grandparents are different with their grandkids yes. than they were with their own children. I don't understand it. But if you are struggling with the rejection and you see someone else getting what it is that you've always desired, it can bother you. That's where the deliverance has to take place. Amen? Okay, I've been sitting here thinking. Yeah, I know, right? And, okay, as a child, I never had nobody hug me until 
told me he loved me. Never. I've never had that in my life. Ever. But yeah, I am such a hugger and loving person. Where in the world did that come from? Because I've never, ever had someone, except for when my father was trying to show off in front of um, his friends, like we were, you know. But I've never had my mother, my father, grandmother, grandfather, I've never had that. Mm-hmm. Ever. But yet, and I can always just say it was God from the from get goes. I, I love people. I mean, I actually love, love, love people. That's that same with personality of yours. Oh my That's God, a people, people person. Okay. That's all it is. Okay. Same ones are very okay. affectionate. Okay. They are. Right. They're touchy feeling. They're very affectionate. Oh, yeah. And then if you top it off and you have a blend, a little bit of compassion there that works in your gifts, oh. you know, the bottom line is you're going, that's naturally inside of you. So sometimes you have individuals that are in homes where none of that is taking place, but yet they're just the opposite. Come on now, let's talk about Susie. Susie is one that's totally opposite. We know, I ain't even going to say that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No, I'm not going to say it. Susie the men ain't different. They from another breed. Yeah. Grandmama's having fun a little on the side or something. But that's all right. To the, to the, look, to the mailman or something. You know, package got delivered. I'm sorry, y'all. We just having fun. Come on. Y'all know the breakthrough I had with with my mom. Yes. But I I still feel rejected in other areas. Yes. When her as a grandmother. Yes. When it comes to my kids versus my sister kids. Oh shit. You know it's like you know you try to I I try to like downplay it you know push it off like "Mm, it's not really like that but it is it's so it's so obvious that it makes me wonder it's like. I don't want it to be get deep down in my heart, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to guard my heart with it, and I'm I'm grown, you know. My kids are grown, but it's still it's like you know, don't not much interest at all in my my children. But my sister kids, my sister kids always over there. I call over there, I hear him in the background, Javon, Javon, and you know, watching watching this, doing this, and. I feel some type of way about it sometimes. So, and, and it's past the mic. She want to respond to that. Talk, talking to Mike. We have daughters. We know that's our grandchild. You a guy. You have a baby by her. Mama's baby. Oh, no, nah, they, look, they look just like all of them. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm just saying, mothers are just closer to the girl's grandkids than the son because... You have a man up here that's disagreeing with you, but okay. he disagrees. Oh, okay. You, yeah. your wife, Mary, has a mother. Well, I'm just saying, you know... My mother... Talking to Mike, talking to Mike. Your, say that again. Your mother has. My mother has three kids, two boys and two girls. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. My mother's closer to my brother and sister children more than she's closer to mine. My kids don't even know my mother, really. Okay. They don't have a relationship with my mother. And guess what? You want to know where that stems from? You and your mother's relationship right. was broken. When the manipulation with your dad and you leaving her, she didn't process her things right. So it caused a breach in your relationship. And so because she's not that close to you, now she's not that close to your kids. And the reality of it is, you're human, he's human, and anybody else that deals with that, that hurts. Especially when, you know, I have children too. But you don't deal with my children. You don't call my children. You don't identify with them. You don't ask them to come over. A whole year can go by or years can go by. You have no no dealings with them. That hurts. That hurts. That's real. We just got to get to a point where we can't let it stop us from being able to move forward. But that's real. That's real hurt. And sometimes it takes being able to have a real conversation. But then you get some old school parents 
They may never get to talk about that. Even if he probably tried to address his mother about it, she may not really want to talk about it. She may not want to talk about the fact that maybe I didn't like the fact you got pregnant, you got a girl pregnant so early on, right out, at, out of high school. I didn't like that. So if they was angry about that situation, that anger carried over, we're disconnected. So you don't connect to that one. Then you don't, you know, so many different things. In his situation, yes, some of them different states. But for real, what we do a lot of times, we make excuses for them. When they can live in another state, it's just a matter of a phone call. So sometimes individuals have to start looking at how their actions affect other people. Because guess what? Those same grandkids going to grow up with some hurts themselves wanting to know why my grandma wasn't never there for me. Why my grandmother ain't never called me. Why my grandmother ain't never baked me cookies. Why my grandmother ain't never buy me a gift? Why I ain't never go over to grandma's house for nothing? I don't even know how my grandma food tastes. But yet, I know my other cousins, they're all the time. It's real. Come on. Nato, and so you have Another child rejected his yep. children. Yep. Like you say, he might not say nothing, but it's there. It's there. He know he has a grandmother. You know yes. what I mean? The difference. It's a cycle. Yeah. It's a cycle that has to stop. It has to stop. My thing is, as long as we've had breath in our bodies, it's not too late to mend relationships. It's not too late to get healed and delivered. But this rejection runs deep. It runs deep. It runs deep. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know every human being has a mother and a father. Every child born to that mother and father has grandparents on the father's side as well as the mother's side. It doesn't take a rocket scientist. And kids know this stuff early in life. Three, four. I wanted to know growing up, why wasn't my daddy there? Was it because of me? I couldn't wait to find out and ask the question. I wanted to know, did I run him off? Did he not want to be there because of me? Did he have another family somewhere else? I wanted to know these things because as a child, if nobody talks to you about stuff, you got to come up with your own, you come up with your own answers. And sometimes your own answers can cause you to hurt even the more. When people need to just start talking and being honest. So rejection is deep. We've come to the end of this teaching on tonight. I like to be mindful of the time. But we're going to continue in this because there are a lot of people that are suffering and dealing with rejection. Rejection hurts, but deliverance is possible. Amen? Amen. Amen. We thank anybody that tuned in on tonight to find out more about our church, our service times and locations. Please go to www.nbttministries.com. Once again, it's a pleasure having you to tune in with us on tonight. Amen? Glory to God.